thank you all for having me. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know your service out here and many of you over the last um, couple of months. And so when I was asked to do this talk, this isn't a talk I've given before, and I borrowed liberally from friends and colleagues and, and put together kind of a curriculum that might appeal both to obstetricians, but especially to non-obstetricians as well, who are sometimes sucked into pregnancy in ways that they didn't anticipate. Um, those of you who don't know what we do this, in general, moms and babies are pretty elastic and pretty tolerant of all that we do, and it takes more than a little to perturb the system. But it can be perturbed, and so, you know, we shouldn't rely on the fact that women are young and healthy when they're, when they're pregnant and babies have great resilience, because sometimes um, they can be hurt, and it's often no fault of anyone's, um, but it's important to recognize that um, they're not entirely immune to all insults. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I get asked a lot of questions um, doing MFM, and, and this is pretty much the simple answer for most that are asking me, you know, can I do this? What should I do with this pregnant woman? I'm worried about nappy. I'm worried this is how I would treat a cancer ordinarily. And the answer is almost always do what you usually do um, because that will keep a mom healthy um, and consequently the pregnancy healthy as well. And then, you know, I, my colleagues are readily at hand for those questions that you have. Others around here can answer. Um, that phone number there is the page operator, and I assure you they're willing to track us down at all hours of the day and night. It's not a problem to do. Labor and delivery is the other number there, and they sure know how to find us who's on call, both um, for the regular OB service, but also the MFM folks as well. So don't hesitate to let us know. Um, I am an obstetrician, you know that. If I was, had pay, really paid attention in medical school, I wouldn't be up at three in the morning and I'd be you know, doing cardiology or something, but I didn't. Um, we are glad to help and I don't make any money out of any of the stuff I'm about to tell you. So I'm gonna divide the talk into three parts. We're gonna talk a little bit about what's different about pregnant women different in terms of their physiology, different in terms of blood values, because for those that aren't accustomed to seeing pregnant women, sometime not uncommonly I'll get a call from an internist or someone in the ED who sent uh, C-reactive protein or some triglycerides and oh my gosh, it's off the wall and they're, they're in a panic. So we'll, we'll talk about what some normal stuff is. I'll offer you a little bit about you know, what, uh, how I approach people. I don't claim to know everything about medicine, surgery at all. It's not uncommon for me to see people with medical problems and so how do I approach someone or, or a colleague that's calling me and says I'm taking care of you know, a patient with this condition and they just call me to say the, the pregnancy test is positive, what do I do? So I'll offer some of that and then we'll go through, I think it's a series of, of five cases, um, five scenarios of emergencies and how to respond to them. And today is, I'm afraid, a little bit like, you know, sip from a fire hose. So I'll apologize if we, we gloss over things too much to fit into the time that's allotted. Um, I'm always glad to, to hear questions or help you do more. So what's different during pregnancy? The answer is near about everything, and there isn't an organ system um, that isn't different. Um, we'll start um, with the cardiovascular system. Um, and that is to start by recognizing there's just an increase in, in blood volume, and that's early on. Um, it plateaus at about um, 32 weeks. If you're having twins or triplets, it's even more. Um, as much as volume expands and red blood cell mass expands, the volume expands more than the mass, and that means you get a dilutional anemia. Uh, and so it's really unusual for us on labor and delivery when we send CBCs to see them come back at 38, 40. And when that happens, we'll see later on that that's gonna strike us as a little unusual and make us wonder about other things, things that cause the plasma volume to contract, things like uh, preeclampsia. Um, and um, you see that listed at the bottom there. Oops. Blood pressure. Um, blood pressure decreases in naders by um, the start of the third um, trimester. You know, the kinds of blood pressures that wouldn't make folks blink in the emergency room 
really make us blink hard on labor and delivery in the office. So in someone that doesn't have a history of chronic hypertension, anything north of 140 or 90 really should give us a little bit of a pause and you know, think about things, whether it's preeclampsia, gestational, gestational hypertension. Um, heart rate increases as well. It's a time of vasodilation. Um, uh, vasodilation and uh, systemic vascular resistance um, is down. So the body is vasodilated, blood pressure down, heart rate up, volume increased. Cardiac output increases as well. Some of that's because you're perfusing the uterus and have to send a lot of blood there. Um, some of it's just the increased blood volume. Um, you see the increases um, there. It's uh, reflected an increase in, in, in stroke volume. Um, and um, because this is necessary, women, patients that have conditions in which they can't increase their cardiac output, and I guess I'm thinking mostly about cardi cardiovascular valvular disease, may not tolerate pregnancy so well. And we'll also talk about that. So here, for those of you that see things best graphically, you see not only compared to the non-pregnant state how cardiac output increases, but how it increases during gestation. And labor is a real challenge. There's a lot of work uh, in labor. Um, and uh, again, we need to be mindful of the, 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 the hurdle that's there. And so as we're thinking about you know, how, how is this patient, how is this woman going to tolerate labor, a lot of the questions we answer are how will they you know, tolerate the extra work, the cardiovascular effort involved. And so all of that summarized here and in the right-hand column, you see how things are changing. So cardiac output up, heart rate up, vascular resistance down. I mention all of that because if you stumble into someone's office and they're not used to seeing these values, they may seem a little different. Well, let's look at the lungs and the respiratory system now. First of all, it's very normal to just have plain old congestion. Um, you know, um, people describe it as stuffiness. Nosebleeds common as well. Um, the ribs flare out. The diaphragm's high. Consequence, um, I'm sorry, and there's an increased ventilatory drive. There's some neat experiments that people did years and years ago where they took male prisoners and they gave them you know, progesterone and estrogen on the order of what they would be seeing if they were pregnant. And they started breathing harder and deeper and sighing more and had the same symptoms, the same sensation that you'll recognize from your pregnant patients of not feeling like they can quite catch their breath. Um, and so ventilation um, does go up and that's reflected in both tidal volume and alveolar ventilation um, as well. All of this means that there's a, a compensated respiratory alkalosis. So people are effectively blowing off their, their CO2. And um, bicarbs are lower um, than um, you expect in a non-pregnant state. Um, and um, pH can be sometimes a little higher than um, we expect. Again, none of, it's, um, none of it's a surprise or a concern except, and we won't talk about asthma tonight, um, but if you have someone that's having an asthma exacerbation and you're doing blood gases and their pH, you know, is 7.4, 7.38, and you think, boy, that's great, you should also be thinking, boy, maybe they are really working quite hard um, and um, they are retaining some CO2 and becoming more acidotic because they've started off at a, at a higher point. I talked before about the diaphragm pushing up. See that there? And that means you just have a decreased residual volume compared to what um, you would have outside of pregnancy. Um, so just a little bit less uh, ability to compensate when, when you need to. Kidneys are, are working overtime. GFR increases by 50%. That means that creatinine, a normal creatinine in pregnancy, really generally south of 0.8. And you know, your lab like ours, it'll read up to 1.5 as being normal. But boy, a creatinine above one in someone who's pregnant, again, should really give us all, all pause. Glycosuria is pretty normal as well. It is not particularly indicative of diabetes or gestational diabetes. 
um, and that's a really rotten screen um, for those tests. Um, there is some normal obstruction of the ureters. It's the gravid uterus, uterus leading on them. And so if you have occasion to get a renal pelvic ultrasound, don't be surprised when it comes back, say, in mild to even moderate hydronephrosis. And so that's a pretty um, normal thing. GI, well, I don't need to tell anyone that, that pregnant women are more likely to have heartburn and, and reflux, and some of that's relaxation of the sphincter. Some of that's just the increased intraperitoneal, intraabdominal pressure pushing things back up. Um, decreased bowel motility. These, are, these tend not to be great and significant problems, um, but really complaints that we all need to manage. And I won't, I won't address these specifically, but except to say that the meds that you're used to using outside of pregnancy really are fine to use in pregnancy, whether that's, you know, uh, ion, H2 blockers and things like that, all, all fine to use. And the over-the-counter is where I usually send my patients. We've already talked about the anemia, but the bone marrow is working a little bit on overtime, and so white counts up to 15, totally normal. Um, and so I, I don't pay any attention to them um, below that level. I'm glad to hear from you along the way if someone has a reason why I should, but um, really can be quite normal. And again, not an uncommon call to get from the ER. Someone's worried because someone came in with some pain and, oh my gosh, their white blood cell counts 13 or 14, and it's easy to be reassuring about that. Pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. Some of that's mechanical, right, compression on blood vessels, decreased return from the lower extremities. But there are also some changes in the coagulation pathway that, um, that push women uh, to be more likely to, to have clots. Perhaps most prominent among them is protein S. Protein S is always normal, uh, normally low in pregnancy. Now, it shouldn't be crazy low. It should be, you know, kind of just under normal if it's more than half of the lower range of normal, that should make you concerned about rare things like protein S deficiency. This comes up a bunch in this day and age when we're in the course of working up a lot of things, sending thrombophilia panels. So I saw someone today that for whatever reason had a thrombophilia panel sent and that was flagged. You know, my advice would be to avoid checking it um, at all um, during pregnancy. Um, and um, if you do check it you, and it is low, you need to wait a good three months afterwards for things to return uh, to their normal levels. And here you see what I've said before in words, graphically, plasma volume increasing more than the red blood cell mass, which um, gives all pregnant women a little bit of uh, dilutional anemia. The thought for those who puzzle through things evolutionarily is that this is a great protection. Right, that way when you're losing volume, when you're losing blood at the time of delivery, you're not losing so many red cells. They're all diluted out. I'm not sure that that's, I don't know how you test a, an evolutionary hypothesis like that, but that's the thinking um, of some behind that. Thyroid binding globulin increases in, in pregnancy, and that means that total T4 will either go up, or if you're someone that's receiving thyroid replacement, you'll need to increase um, the thyroid replacement. That happens really early. TBG rises in response to estrogens, which are increased early in pregnancy. And so if you're taking care of a patient in your primary care practice or otherwise, and she calls and says that she's pregnant, it's a simple thing to do if, you, if she's not inclined to come in and get her TSH checked is to tell her to double up on her thyroid dose Wednesday, Sunday, two days a week. Well, obviously, whatever it is you want can work. Um, and you should not be surprised that you'll need to continue to increase it, the thyroid replacement as pregnancy goes along. Um, and um, generally target a, a TSH of 2 to 2.5 or lower. We can talk about that. At, that's afterwards. But that's um, probably uh, levels like that are associated with better neurodevelopmental outcome in newborns. Um, so um, whereas outside of pregnancy, we might be inclined to let a TSH of four to five ride. In pregnancy, that should be a cause to increase thyroid uh, replacement. 
The pancreas is working overtime because there's um, some insulin resistance. Insulin resistance in response to uh, human placental lactogen and other hormones made um, by the, the placenta. Um, insulin resistance, when it reaches certain levels, is known as gestational diabetes. The whole notion of gestational diabetes years ago was people recognized that there was some insulin resistance in pregnancy. The idea was to use pregnancy as a stress test. Let's find those pancreases that are living a little bit on the edge and use that to predict later diabetes. And it works quite well for that. So gestational diabetes um, doesn't just, does go away after pregnancy, but it shouldn't be ignored because it um, can identify a group that are at risk for diabetes um, later in life. Um, um, that, that risk seems amenable both to lifestyle reductions, so diet and exercise, but also to things like metformin as well. So women with gestational diabetes, particularly when tested afterwards, who have some borderline insulin resistance, we should think about um, what interventions we can make to keep them from, um, keep them from uh, becoming incident cases of type 2 diabetes. Whole bunch of changes here. I, I never understood the immune system. I'm not sure that I, that I do now. Um, I, I guess what I'm going to suggest is that there is some increased, increased susceptibility to things like malaria, varicella, CMV, CMV, number one cause of congenital deafness in this country. About one to two percent of women are infected during, during pregnancy. Um, other conditions um, are improved because the, the, the same changes that make women more susceptible um, to infections kind of, you know, hold a lot of autoimmune conditions in check. And so people can find, in many cases, a little bit of a holiday from things like rheumatoid arthritis and other such conditions. Some of you may have seen this. This is a neat article um, from the New England Journal of Medicine just two weeks ago. Um, I guess you see here a listing of common infectious conditions, difference in susceptibility and severity. Listeriosis, particularly troublesome for pregnant women because it can affect the placenta um, associated with intraplacental abscesses and intrauterine fetal demise. But I guess the one that I would point out in particular is influenza. We'll return to this later. Pregnant women are no more likely to get the flu, but when they get it, they're much more likely to get sicker as a result of it. And so one of the things I'll highlight later on is our need to be vigilant for that and treat folks um, accordingly. So that's kind of what's different. Um, what do you do when someone who's not perfectly healthy calls and says they want to be pregnant or they are pregnant? How to, how to think about that? How how not to panic, what are the first steps to take? Um, and, and this seems trite, and so I apologize. I know it's obvious to, to most of you um, that you know, uh, healthy women make for healthy pregnancies. Um, and most of the things that have kept women healthy up to pregnancy can be continued during pregnancy. The number of things that really are precluded um, are small. That said, it's best, whether it's Crohn's or asthma or chronic hypertension, to get it under control um, in advance. Things that are quiescent are more likely to stay that way during pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a great time to be experimenting with new and different therapies. And there may be some things that you want to optimize in advance. You know, there's that you're following, I don't know what, that you get you know, yearly CAT scans of this, that, and the other thing. Um, you know, avoid the stress of the call from the radiologist who says, you know, do you know she's pregnant? You know, do it all in advance. Um, that said, 50% is the number that's quoted for unplanned pregnancies in this country, um, and that's true of our medical patients um, as well. So, you know, when we're seeing folks, seeing women of reproductive age, we should think about, you could get pregnant if we, if whether it's a medicine or a condition, and we think that there is some real risk here, and now is not the time to be pregnant, and the patient agrees, the next question, of course, needs to be, well, what are we doing for 
contraception here to, to prevent that. <coughs> um, more of what I've said. You know, things that, whether it's thyroid or blood sugar or blood pressure, things that we might tolerate more outside of pregnancy, we're less likely to tolerate in pregnancy, especially the early stages uh, of pregnancy. Uh, diabetes is the classic example of that. I drive my endocrine colleagues crazy because the control that we shoot for is much tighter, much stricter than what they're uh, willing to tolerate outside of, of pregnancy. Um, and I think the next slide, yeah. High blood sugars as reflected in hemoglobin A1C is clearly associated and probably along the causal pathway of many congenital uh, abnormalities, including important cardiac um, conditions. And it tracks right with the hemoglobin A1C. Um, and so, you know, uh, you really want to have folks in better control if they're anticipating pregnancy and or if someone calls you early in pregnancy, you know, you may still have a window to jump all over it and uh, improve their control. Um, you have the luxury of someone saying, listen, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about starting a family. My partner and I are thinking about starting a family. What do we need to do? A um, couple of things here on the slide that I'd emphasize. It's amazing to me the number of folks who still enter pregnancy um, haven't had a vaccination or don't have a detectable immunity to rubella in particular. Congenital rubella syndrome is something really to avoid. And um, so it's a live, although attenuated vaccine. We try, we do avoid it in pregnancy, although it's really difficult to point to any harm from it. Um, open registries really don't identify it being as a great risk. But if someone's pregnant, we won't give them MMR, so great to do that in advance. Folic acid, folic acid, folic acid. I can't say that enough, and folks don't get it in their diet. People like me, maternal fetal medicine, prenatal diagnosis, you know, part of our living used to be made by finding neural tube defects, and encephaly, important birth defects like that. I can't tell, it, it's just, it hasn't disappeared, but the numbers that we see are much, much lower. This is a great and wonderful public health success. But the neural tube closes early in the, in the, you know, by the mid, you know, eight to nine weeks in the first trimester. So if you're seeing someone for a first prenatal visit at 10 or 11 weeks, it's too late to give them the folic acid. Fine to do, but it's not going to make a difference in, on things like this. And so we really need to um, get in the habit. Someone's thinking about being pregnant. This is the number one recommendation. At least 400 micrograms, you can't overdose really on the stuff. And it may be that 800 or even more is, is, is a little better. Um, so really a, 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 great, um, a great thing to do. Those of you who are interested in public health may say, well, why don't we just fortify our foods? And there's a great debate there. You know, it's a great debate about masking pernicious anemia and this and that. Uh, suffice it to say that we don't. Other countries do. Um, so we really need to rely on folks taking prenatal vitamins. It's another time when, you know, they come to see us or early in pregnancy. One of the first things we do is we do a family history and screen those who are interested. You know, are you a carrier for cystic fibrosis? Everyone, everyone across the board is offered CF testing, at least in, in this country. It may be that knowing that in advance is important to folks. So they're not wrestling with this or, you know, tracking down their partner, getting them to come in and get tested to see if they're a carrier too early in pregnancy. Other things to screen for depends on background, ethnicity, origins in the world. Um, again, all of these things can be done during pregnancy, but there's more time to puzzle through and, and make informed decisions if they're done before pregnancy. I'll admit it's unusual, I think, for those things to happen in advance of pregnancy. Smoking cessation, weight loss, great benefits to pregnancy. Weight loss, higher risk of miscarriage, higher risk, uh, or, or elevated BMI, higher risk of miscarriage, higher risk of birth defects, higher risk of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, higher risk of stillbirth, greater need for cesarean delivery, more complications from cesarean delivery. I don't know, is there anything that being overweight isn't associated with in terms of 
adverse outcome. Um, you know, pregnancy is another. And so, you know, if people come and they say, well, what can I do to have the healthiest pregnancy possible? Um, that would be it. And then, of course, is the elephant in the room, medications. People are on medications. Um, study, one of my colleagues showed that 50% of pregnant women um, receive or are on a prescription medication during pregnancy. So optimizing those is important. Yuck, the FDA classifications, right? That's what everyone reads, particularly now in this Google age. They look, A is good, D is bad, and that's the end of it, right? And that's all they see and hear, and that's, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I get sent patients who've been taken off of this medicine that's controlled their blood pressure beautifully for the last five years, and someone called up, and they looked, and they said, oh, that's class C, you have to stop it. And now they're seeing us two weeks later, and their blood pressure is nice and high. Um, so, you know, really, I, I all but ignore them. These are, there is a plan, I, I swear, to revise these. It's been, it's been worked on. It's like, it's like in the FDA queue, and it's just not at the top of the list. Um, you know, it's kind of ready to go, but they need to roll it out for public comment, however our government and the FDA works. And it's always next year, next year, next year. Um, so for the moment, we're still stuck with these and you'll get a lot of calls about them, but when you, when you get a call or you're thinking of it, I would, I would you know, avoid the temptation to just look in the PDR or look in what we all carry around these days, Hippocrates or something like that, and look beyond the letter. There are lots of great resources. Um, um, I'll, I'll show you one in a second. Part of the problem is we, we have rotten data, right? If I really wanted to do the study and I had this new med and I came at my patients in the waiting room and I said, here, I want to find out if this is going to be bad for you or your baby. We you sign up, we'll flip a coin, heads, sugar pill, tails, you get this medicine, you don't, I mean, no one's going to do the study, right? And so all of our information comes from people that have reasons to take um, medicines. But immediately you'd say, well, I've got this antihypertensive someone's using and it seems like it makes babies' noses turn upside down. And, and you'd say to me right away, well, is that the high blood pressure or is that the medicine? And, and, and it's, really a, it's really a problem. And it gets even more complicated. I was counseling some woman this morning whose list of medicines was like 10 long. You know, all kinds of new stuff for asthma and, and, and Prozac and, 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 you know, it goes on and on and on. And, you know, I can talk about individual medicines, but clever patients will say, okay, well, I get it. I get it that, that this is fine, that the Remicade isn't so bad, that the, you know, the, the, um, um, the, the Prozac is okay, but what about when they're used together? And now you're really in a, in a data-free zone. Um, and, and the other thing to recognize that I know all of you do, but our patients, you know, really don't. If, if you know, sometimes during my visits with patients, I'll say, what do you think the risk of just having a birth defect is? If, you, if I give 100 women orange juice and they drank it every day, what do you think the chances that their kids, how many will have a birth defect? And I say, and, they, and then I tell them it's three, three percent, and they look at me, they're horrified because they've, they've had orange juice and they're like convinced that the orange juice is bad now. And so I've learned to not quite do it that way or at least anticipate it. But, you know, that number is higher than many people think. And as, as much as some medicines won't cause congenital anomalies, they also won't make that number better. And so we need to be mindful of that. I agree that the things listed at the bottom are the general advice that's offered. But for someone that has a condition and needs medication, I'm not sure that that's best advice, right? We're going to yank you off of your asthma meds, um, you know, because we want you on the fewest doses. I mean, this is good advice whether you're pregnant or not, right? So if, you're, if I'm seeing someone and they say, well, you know, I was started on this medicine in college. You know, I, I've been taking this, uh, I don't know, Prozac or, or uh, an asthma med since I've been in college. And... I don't really know why I'm taking it anymore. I was 20 years ago, and I, you know, I, well, whether you're pregnant or not, I'm not sure that there, you, you know, you should be continuing without having a, a real reason. So pregnancy is sometimes a time to revisit things like that. This is Reprotox, um, which um, we have available at our place. You may have it too through the Micromedic system. Um, it's really a great resource. It, it offers you a quick kind of one-liner at the top here, so when you're you're rushed and, you know, you can just look, quick take on good, bad, in between. But then here it'll lay out everything, what the studies are available, how good they are, breastfeeding as well, 
um, it's all there. And so I, I, I think I, I rely on this much more than the, much more than the, the, the letters. There really are few things. There are a few things that have that category X. There are a few things that are known to Radigens. And I, I'll, I'll just, I won't dwell on these forever. Um, valproic acid, pretty common one, clearly associated with neural tube defects. Um, so that's a great one to think about stopping in advance. A lot of other antiepileptics, whether it's carmazepine, phenytoin, associated with a, a spectrum of, of anomalies. Um, it seems like, you know, every couple of years there's a new anti-epileptic, anti-seizure med that's touted. This is great. You can use it in pregnancy because it's not going to be associated with this. And, you know, once they study it more and get some more time, they find that there's something going on there. Lithium, bipolar disorder, has a bad rap. Epstein's anomaly displacement of the tricuspid valve and fetuses. It's a bad thing and it happens, but much less commonly, well south of one in a thousand. So it used to be that, you know, lithium, you had to come off your, there are patients that it's appropriate to continue things like lithium on because it works and, and controls their, their, their bipolar disorder. And then some things, warfarin and alcohol are examples. You know, we think about, people think, okay, if I just get through the first trimester, it'll all be okay. But some things can really affect, there's a lot of development, neurodevelopment that continues beyond the first trimester. And so some things, warfarin, alcohol are two great examples, continue to affect pregnancies well beyond the first trimester. So it's not a question of, well, I'm seeing you, you're in the second trimester, ah, the damage has been done, you know, keep on what you're on. Um, there really are opportunities to change. Cocaine's a funny one. It can cause it probably really doesn't belong on this list. Cocaine can cause lots of bad things for women's health and bad things for pre pregnancy. Um, ter it's probably not teratogenic. It probably doesn't cause um, congenital anomalies. How will pregnancy affect a condition? And this assumes that people are not just yanked off their medicines and have given up their medications, right? Someone who has asthma and suddenly takes stops their medicine, it's not fair to say this is how pregnancy is affecting the condition. A lot of it's the increased work. Inflammatory conditions can improve, but in general, many things don't get better or worse. They just follow their natural course. So yeah, you can have a flare of your lupus during pregnancy, but it's not clear that pregnancy makes lupus flares more common or less common for that matter. And we just all need to be prepared to, to deal um, with the flares that, that may occur. So what are the things on the, on the left is a table about mild, moderate, to high risk, but on the right are the things that when I see them in my office, I see them on my schedule really give us pause. And I imagine, I would hope when you see them on your schedule, you're telling them, go see those guys in Boston. They'll, they'll talk with you a little bit about it. Because these are the things that, 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 that kill mothers, right? So Eisenmenger syndrome, primary pulmonary hypertension, probably a mortality risk to moms of 25 to 50 percent. So people really need to consider seriously whether or not they're going to continue their pregnancy. Complicated co-arched aortic root um, dilation. They've had cardiomyopathy um, before. I know some of my friends were out talking about this a little while ago, but they've never quite recovered. They still have a decreased ejection fraction. These are the kinds of things that really aren't going to do, do well. Um, during pregnancy. The predictors with cardiovascular disease of who's not going to do well are just what you might expect, so I won't dwell on them. Basically, it's, it's folks that are sick or entering pregnancy aren't going to do so well. And that's true of a lot of things. It's true for renal disease and, and diseases of other organs, systems as well. So let's flip the condition, let's flip the question around, not how will pregnancy affect my condition or disease, but how will the condition affect the pregnancies? We'll see that increasingly we recognize that things like preeclampsia are diseases of the endothelium. Because when I was in medical school, that wasn't even an organ system, right? It just kind of sat there and it held the blood in, and we now recognize that it produces all kinds of substances 
that course through our bodies that are related to inflammation. And so things that are associated with inflammation and endothelial activation are also associated with growth restriction uh, and preeclampsia. Uh, renal disease, chronic hypertension, autoimmune disease, all, all fall into that category. Insulin resistance, whether it's um, underlying insulin resistance that's subclinical or the insulin resistance that goes along with weight is associated with gestational diabetes. Um, you know, always good to think a little bit about not just how, you know, it will affect being pregnant and staying pregnant, but what about delivery? There aren't very many things that people really can't push for. Very few cardiac conditions. Um, many cardiac conditions are rate dependent, but with a good epidural, you can avoid the increases in rate with pushing a lot of times. I argue a ton with my neurosurgeon friends about, you know, is are we really increasing the pressure that much that someone's going to blow an aneurysm? It's really difficult to argue that that's so. And, you know, you'll stumble across people that have had these aneurysms for a while and been pregnant and only just stumbled on them, you know, now in a third or fourth pregnancy, and they'll say, well, I pushed for the last couple. You know, I, I, it, it's difficult sometimes to make the recommendation and say that you're fine and it's not going to happen, but it's probably not so much of an issue. Do you have any data on intracranial pressure? Um, we, we do have some data on intracranial pressure, not a lot. It doesn't go up as a, a ton. I can't give you the numbers. Um, not, you know, more than a lot of other things we Valsalva for. Um, so, um, you know, I, there are some of my colleague, neurosurgical colleagues out there that will recognize that it's fine. It's not things like allowing a baby to labor down and then using vacuum or forceps to get it out and avoiding the C-section, um, a real option. It's important with a lot of things to consider mode of inheritance because it's not just about, you know, how it's going to affect growth inside, but is the child that will result from a pregnancy, is it going to be a carrier or affected with a particular condition? Um, autosomal dominant conditions, um, things like neurofibromatosis come to mind. Before we turn to individual cases, I'll talk, you know, some whatabouts, questions that we all get. No problem with ultrasound, no problem with MRI. When I send someone for a... So we use MRI now for complex congenital abnormalities. We run moms through the MRI scanner and look at their fetus with the MRI. We use it, you know, great tool because we'll talk about, you know, do we want to avoid radiation? So someone will worry about nappy, will we use MRI? When I send them to MRI, it's still true, I'm ashamed to admit. My radiology friends will make them sign a consent saying that they're pregnant and they're having an MRI. And when I'm in an ordinary mood, I ask them what the risk, you know, what they're telling them the risk is. Yeah, there's, no, there's no risk that anyone's identified. You know, I don't, I don't, they're, they're making them sign the, con the consent form for I don't know why, honestly. Um, gadolinium, not great data on, and so um, in general that's, that's avoided, although uh, tough to point to a lot of things that are really dangerous there. And most studies, most x-ray studies can be done. Great to shield, great to avoid the first trimester, but again here the, the watchword has to be do what you need to do to keep a mom healthy. Right? If you think someone has a pneumonia and you want to diagnose with a chest x-ray, don't say, oh, you're pregnant. I can't figure out if you have a pneumonia. Uh, came up once, uh, CT scans versus CT scans. Um, mostly we do CT PAs in, 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 in times before that. We would do VQ scans. I, I don't think you're going to find a nuclear medicine person that's going to dose anyone in this day and age. So spiral CT, and we'll look at some of the doses here. There you go. Some of them are here. I don't know if CT of the head or chest. So you'll see less than a rat um, delivered to the fetus. And there really is no evidence of birth defects, growth restriction, miscarriage below five rads. And in truth, and we know this, you know, from crazy situations in the world, things like atomic bombs falling when people were pregnant and stuff, and nuclear accidents in parts of the world. You know, the threshold is probably well, well above that. You really probably need to get 
above 20, 40, 50 rads before anything like that comes up. There is epidemiologic data that suggests that with small doses, one to two rads, you can increase the risk of childhood leukemia. You know, the data does support that risk. It's important, as in all things in medicine, to recognize the difference between a relative risk. I can scare women by saying, you know, the risk is one and a half to two-fold higher and absolute risk. It's still just one in 2,000. By the way, did you know that the risk was one in 3,000 to start even without this? So I'm not saying that we should use radiation willy-nilly, but there are times when clearly it's an appropriate thing to do, and a spiral CT would be great. Much worse for a pregnancy to have an undiagnosed or untreated PE than to avoid um, x-rays altogether. Exercise. I don't know, common question for me. You know, mothers, grandmothers, aunts used to tell pregnant women to take it easy to be off your feet. Certainly, if anything like a little bit of bleeding happened or anything else that made uh, folks anxious in pregnancy, but it's really difficult, not only is it difficult to demonstrate that exercise really of almost any level is associated with adverse outcome in pregnancy, but there's some reasonable data that suggests exercise, including for things like miscarriages associated with better outcome. Um, so really very little, very few occasions to recommend activity restrictions. Maybe someone with preeclampsia who we're trying to eke some more time out of um, will recommend being on bed rest. Um, um, but um, uh, really few other things. Um, you know, I, I put it up there, it sounds silly. Well, you want to avoid things where you're really going to fall and hit your stomach, you know, and so, you know, uh, competitive rugby, not so great when you're pregnant. <laughs> you, you may be the greatest skier in the world, but, you know, I'm skiing next to you and I'm not so good and I may run into you, right? Things that rely on balance, bicycle riding, rollerblading, you know, your center of gravity changes. So it's not that the exercise is bad. Um, being on your back supine, oh my gosh, people think, you know, they're, they're, their partners are waking them up in the middle of the night. You're on your back. You have to get up. Oh, my God. You know, yes, being on your back for a long period of time does decrease blood flow to the uterus, and that's where our data ends. Never been linked to growth restriction or abnormalities. Please, no one should wake you up in the middle of the night because you're on your back. And it's fine to be at the gym and be on your back for 15 to 20 minutes you know, if you're doing some stretching or some sit-ups, so don't need to avoid all that. How about long-distance runners? Um, I mean, we get, I get occasionally, I mean, people that are marathon yeah. runners, I mean, that's are So really difficult to demonstrate that it's dangerous. There's some evidence that suggests quicker be labors, better labors. In terms of growth, maybe a difference in a couple of hundred grams. Usually we get calls about that. There's, you know, someone who's run the New York or the Chicago Marathon and the newspapers want to do a story. Um, I wouldn't recommend th that pregnancy is a great time to push to the next level, but in someone who really is a well-trained and competitive athlete, you know, continuing it, really difficult to demonstrate that that's associated with adverse outcome. Um, really difficult to demonstrate that. Um, there's a woman last year who ran the Chicago Marathon, crossed the finish, like 38 weeks, crossed the finish line with a time much better than mine, right? And, and, and then like went to the hospital to have a baby, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh my God. Um, you know, I, we won't dwell on this. Uh, you know, you can, you know, you can do things like chemo. Um, you know, it, much better to treat a breast cancer than to say, oh my gosh, you're, you're 25 weeks pregnant. You have to, you know, you, you, you got to wait. You got to wait until you deli um, Really is some reasonable evidence. Not that it's without some effects, but much better tolerated than you think. Elective surgery, especially in the second trimester, um, really associated with a very low, if measurable, rate of loss. Common sense things, you know, maintain blood pressure and oxygenation. Uh, hip roll under the right hip, you know, tilted 
off to the left side will improve flow to the, to the uterus. In most cases, there is no need for continuous monitoring because the perturbations in physiology would not be expected to affect um, uh, a pregnancy. Are there other, um, before we turn to the cases, I'll let you, see, you do obstetrics, you become a magnet for things like this. Um, other things that people have wondered about? Can, is it okay to or not to? Okay. So we'll do what to do when. So these are five cases, that, uh, five kind of situations. I think they're common. Um, they're kind of things that will get an obstetrician's heart racing, but also the kinds of things that may get ER docs and internists and anesthesiologists sucked into our lives. Um, and so I'll try to cover them from kind of a general perspective, focusing a little less on what obstetricians and midwives need to know, and a little more about just what the general hospital and medical community um, should think about. So, right, we recognize this case. The blood pressure is up. There's protein in the urine. It's a f young first pregnancy, preeclampsia, right? You'll see the creatinine 1.2 is normal, but I told you that's not normal in pregnancy. The hematocrit is 38. That's also higher. So all of this goes along um, with preeclampsia. I won't dwell on the definitions except to point out that north of 140 over 90 is not normal in pregnancy. A couple of different ways to define proteinuria, whether it's headaches, scotomata, just malaise, right upper quadrant pain, all those things go along with preeclampsia. Weight gain more reliable than edema. Anyone that's walked through an obstetrician's waiting room and looked at all the patients there in the third trimester, their ankles, they're swelling swollen like crazy. So when we're really concerned about, it's, you know, someone who's gained three, four, five pounds in a week, whose face is different, whose hands are swollen, forget, forget the ankles. I know you know all this. I won't dwell on this. The vessels are leaky. Kidneys are secreting protein. Vasospasm. We don't understand why people actually get eclamptic seizures, but it's thought the best hypothesis this kind of local dysregulation of blood flow. So again, who is that? Mark Green, right from ER. There was a famous episode where, he, like, you know, he missed the woman with preeclampsia who came back in, and I forget if she died. You know, she died, or the baby was then breached. There was all kinds of stuff, and for reasons unknown to me, they couldn't send her to the OB floor. Right on how it is here, in my experience, the fastest way to get out of the emergency room is to just say, I'm pregnant. And you can see the Doppler shift as they kind of send you off to, to labor and delivery, you know, with the gunshot, the knife still sticking out of your chest, right? Um, so um, blood pressure, we talked about all these values. It, it, um, it's not just term and it's not just people can get preeclampsia after delivery. I can't explain to you why it is. We'll talk a little bit about how delivery of the, uh, the placenta should make preeclampsia better. And so when I give this a talk to medical students, you know, there's always two or three of them say, well, how come? I don't know. It just happens. So just because someone's delivered, you can't forget about it. And rarely, the placenta doesn't read the books. And there are some people that have blood pressures that aren't north of 140 over 90, but do have everything else that goes along with preeclampsia. So yes, it's the blood pressure that should make you think about it, but not always. Um, so it's a, you know, like all of our diseases, it, it can sometimes present in, in lots of different ways. So as I said, it's a disease of endothelial activation that probably results from very early I'm talking like six to eight weeks abnormalities of implantation of the placenta. Imbalances of angiogenic factors. S-flit is something that's floating around in all our body. It gloms onto VEGF. Higher levels of S-flit, lower levels of placental-like growth factor clearly associated with preeclampsia. It may be that someday we figure out ways to bump up women's levels of VEGF and that'll fix preeclampsia. But that's a, a long way away. Good estimate is five, probably close to 5% of pregnancies, but higher if you have these underlying conditions, including 
obesity. And um, I wouldn't need to dwell on it except to say that early abnormal trophoblast invasion probably leads to hyperperfusion of the placenta, local hypoxia, increases these factors, which later cause the endothelium to get annoyed and angry, and that leads to platelet activation and edema and hemolysis and all the other changes that go along with preeclampsia. And it's clear that in women with preeclampsia, the vessels are just tighter and stiffer, less nitrous oxide synthase production. So really, you can demonstrate this in, in, in a host of ways. Um, and that probably is a result of things like these are levels of SFLT. And in women who will get preeclampsia, the levels are higher. And women who actually have it, the levels are much higher. This has led to people developing diagnostic studies and looking at SFLT, um, SFLT uh, PLGF levels as predictors or, or diagnostic of preeclampsia. Suffice it to say it works, but it's of no demonstrable clinical utility. The overlap with normals is too, is too broad, and it's very unclear what the heck, you know. So people have developed urine tests that you could do on women at 20 to 24 weeks and say, oh my gosh, Mrs. Smith, you're at increased risk for getting preeclampsia later on. Yeah, we're not certain you're going to get it, but, and that's the problem, but what should they do? There's nothing to, to intervene. So, you know, you guys will see these. They're marketed. The reps will come around. Don't you want to do this? And, um, I, you know, just not a role for it clinically. So here's someone that's a little worse, right? Same patient, but now this blood pressure. So 160 over 110 pregnant woman, that should set off alarms. I know, you know, if you're an internist and someone comes in with that, you'll say, okay, we'll see in two weeks. We'll check your blood pressure again in the ER. You know, won't even get a yawn. In a pregnant woman, levels like this are associated with things all of us want to avoid, strokes, seizures. That should be like, we got to do something about this. Other things that go along with severe preeclampsia, yeah, they just removed a lot of protein, but a lot of protein from the definition, but used to be that this got you there. Low platelets, not in this case, but elevated liver function test. So severe disease, you see the threshold there. Abnormal LFTs, oliguria, fetal compromise growth restriction. So there are lots of variations um, on typical preeclampsia. Why does it matter? Well, it matters a little bit. Well, well, we'll talk about some of the complications, then we'll talk about how to manage it. So, um, mostly related to blood pressure, placenta can separate. We'll talk about this in a second when we get to the bleeding cases, abruptio placenta. Um, moms can get really sick as pregnancy progresses. Um, we talked about differences in colloid oncotic pressure and leaky vessels, pulmonary edema. Acute renal failure, if you sit on it long enough, people will stop urinating, creatinines will go, go up, eclampsia, so the pre is before you get the seizure, not really common in this country, um, and all these other things. Again, um, not happily, not a, a big problem in this country, some of the fetal things here, so growth restrictions, stillbirth, sometimes we say you're so sick you can't continue with pregnancy, you have to have a baby yet. 28 weeks at 32 weeks. Um, the answer to treatment is delivery. It actually turns out to be delivery of the placenta. If we could just figure out a way to deliver the placenta and not the baby, we'd be all set, right? But no one's figured that out yet. Can obviously, I mean, no, you, no, you all know this. It's a real dilemma when folks are really preterm. Um, and so it's led us, even with severe disease, you know, it's easy at 37 weeks, right? Someone has preeclampsia at 37 weeks, have a baby. That's what we do. Um, but what if someone's 30 weeks or 28 weeks? And in cases like that, there are arguments to be made for expectant management um, because kids can need to be born suddenly and suddenly prematurely should really be at centers both with you know, able to treat the mom when she gets sick, but they're able to treat the baby as well. So I don't imagine you all are sitting on too many folks with severe preeclampsia, a lot of heads shaking, no, what am I, crazy? Um, I, 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 
want to point out that neither magnesium nor antihypertensive treat make preeclampsia better. You can make the blood pressure lower. You can keep someone from having a seizure by giving them magnesium, but that doesn't mean that moms still can't get crazy sick, um, help syndrome, babies can't get sick, um, you know, small and, 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 and die while you're watching. So we shouldn't think that, oh, we've got your blood pressure better, it's all good, the disease is cured, you can, you can go home. What about when someone has an eclamptic seizure? Well, eclamptic seizures, they are self-limited and they do stop. So what you would do, I think, I hope, with anyone who's seizing is keep them from being a harm to themselves, keep them from hurting themselves, falling, falling on their abdomen. You know, I, I, it's a game. I don't, it's not really a game, but it, it's, you know, with my anesthesiologist, how long I can keep them before they'll watch a seizure, before they have to break it. You know, and then usually it's about two or three minutes. They really do, eclamptic seizures stop, they're self-limited. Um, but um, it's, it, it's difficult for me to, to control my anesthesia colleagues, who, who I understand why, want to break the seizure. Um, so some Ativan can do that. Magnesium, clearly very helpful in preventing uh, recurrent seizures. Um, we usually do it by giving a bolus and then a continual infusion. But, 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 be sure someone is urinating and that their kidneys haven't shut down before you start piling on the continual infusion of magnesium. In someone that is oliguric, it's maybe best to give them the bolus and just sit tight um, following mag levels, um, um, renal function, and be bolusing them when you need to rather than you'll make folks mag toxic if you just run it in ad lib in someone that's not urinating. Yes, eclampsia, I mean, you'll, you'll see folks write papers about kind of the expected management of women that have had eclamptic seizure, and I think that's generally labeled as crazy stuff. If you have, a, if you have an eclamptic seizure, you're going to deliver. Um, but you don't, need to, you don't need to rush and do it right away. Get mom safe. The baby's heart rate will recover. Be sure you can control their airway before you rush to deliver them. It sounds crazy. You don't have to do a C-section. If someone's advanced, um, I, you don't have to, although I recognize as a practical matter, most places, including yours and ours, uh, many women will, most women will be delivered by cesarean delivery. Before I leave preeclampsia, this is the point I would make. Blood pressure's high. You need to treat it. You need to treat it promptly. By promptly, I mean if it's high, Recheck it in 10 to 15 minutes. If it's still high, it needs to get treated. Labetalol, hydralazine, reasonable regimens. It can't get IV access. PO nifedipine and can be used while you're getting IV access. All of these things um, will, will, will promptly lower blood pressure. There are checklists for this. This is one from the American College of OBGYN about how to treat um, this is just kind of the summary. It'll run down, you know, you give this dose, you try it this many times. If it doesn't work, then you switch to something else. Most hospitals, labor and delivery should have these around so they can easily um, be referred to. I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of, of treating um, blood pressures of 160 over 110 in pregnant women. And then for those of you who aren't obstetricians, um, I do want to point out that, um, you know, preeclampsia does clearly have some implications in women's life and health beyond pregnancy. And it's not, you know, if you're seeing someone and, oh, you had preeclampsia and it was really bad in your last two pregnancies, but you've had your tubes tied, okay, who cares anymore? It really is reliably associated with cardiovascular complications, um, renal complications as well later in life. What remains to be demonstrated is whether or not there are ways we as physicians can meaningfully intervene in this cascade. And so you've had someone that's had preeclampsia. You know they're at risk for bad things. What should we do? I don't think anyone knows. Should, should we, you know, this diet and exercise? Is it having them on a statin? Is it, is it something that prevents this later um, morbidity? But at the very least, these are women 
that if they come through your primary care practice, you should think, okay, is this a risk factor that I should treat the same way I would treat smoking or family history, and maybe I'm screening them for lipids or checking their blood pressure or more frequently or advising them more strongly about diet and exercise. So that's, I know, a much too quick view of, of preeclampsia, hypertensive complications. Are there questions folks have about that? Okay. Obstetric hemorrhage. It's a common thing and it's a nightmare. Um, lots of different times folks can bleed. We're going to focus on around delivery. The bleeding uh, with miscarriage and ectopic can be great, unrecognized ectopic, because that's, that's just not the topic today. Um, and it's, the volumes pale by comparison to, to what can be lost in the third trimester. We'll go through the differential of preterm labor, abruption, previa, and then look at the most common one, which is atony, atony after delivery. Okay, so here's someone who comes prior C-section. That's a setup for previa speculum exam. You know, we're taught as, as residents not to do speculum exams on folks with placenta previas because you'll irritate the previa and it'll suddenly bleed all over. I'm not sure that's really true. I mean, I guess I wouldn't want to go ahead and stick your, stick your finger in it. You know, it, it, this really, the days of an undiagnosed placenta previa are really, I, I, they're over, right? It used to be, you know, when I was in training, everyone had ultrasounds. But now we really know who's at risk for a, a previa. So it's, un, it's unlikely for us to be surprised by doing a pelvic exam and suddenly getting more bleeding. Abruption, so painful bleeding in the third trimester. Trauma, hypertension, um, a lot of blood, but the placenta can be higher up. Atony, so distended uterus, twins. You've given them magnesium, so the muscle that is the uterus isn't clamped down as well. You've been inducing them for two days on oxytocin. They have an infection, chorioamnionitis, all setups for a uterus. And finally, you know, you feel like, great success. We finally got the baby out. It's all good. I can, you know, pack it up and go home. And, you know, suddenly they're bleeding like stink. Um, it's really tough to know. I mean, you know, studies have demonstrated that we're rotten at, at predicting uh, uh, how much patients are bleeding. And, and pregnant women are young and healthy, and they can lose, we'll see in a second, a ton of blood before their vital signs. You know, the, the common saying, you've all seen it, they're fine until they're not fine. It's like they're bleeding and it's all good, and suddenly, where'd she go? Um, and, um, I, I mean, this is true in trauma, it's true in OB. It takes a while to acrylibrate, so your CBC isn't going to be a great predictor. Upper limits of normal here, 500 and 1,000 for vaginal delivery and cesarean delivery as best as we can predict it. Kind of classifying hemorrhage, and it really takes losing a bunch of blood, you know, over a liter, probably before you really start to push your heart rate up, close to two liters before your blood pressure starts to go down. So vital signs can be deceiving. And people can look like they're doing okay until suddenly they're, they're crazy sick. Why do we care? This is what kills moms. It kills moms in this country and it kills them around the world. 10% of um, maternal deaths are related to, to, to um, obstetric hemorrhage. Um, and um, it can, you know, it, when it happens beforehand, it can not be great for a baby. When it happens afterwards, it can affect... Um, all kinds of other organs and organ function. Um, and so um, um, this is worldwide, these statistics. One in a thousand women around the world die from obstetric hemorrhage. Less in developed countries, very common in other parts of the world. So a leading cause of pregnancy mortality. 
in this country, this number is from our country, one in 1,500 deliveries will get admitted to an ICU because of obstetric hemorrhage. Brian Bateman is one of my anesthesia colleagues um, and um, just looked at um, um, those women with um, hypovolemic shock from bleeding and all the stuff that goes along with it. So it really, you know, when it gets bad, it can be plenty bad. And it's not getting better. So this is the time trend. And you see, for a bunch of reasons, some related to C-section rates, some related to the way we practice induction, some related to, I'm not sure, we're sure what, but the risks of, the rates of hemorrhage seem to be rising. Now, some of this is we're a victim a little bit of the attention we've placed on it. And we're getting quicker to diagnose it and to do things about it and to intervene. But some of this is, is probably real. So you'll see it regularly here as we see it. In our, you know, this is something that none of us can, can avoid. But yet, as people look at, back at the morbidity and even the mortality associated with it, it seems to be a preventable something. What's the percentage, like, just overall of um, postpartum coverage in the normal population? Um, on the order of 1% to 2%. Yeah. I mean, again, it depends a little bit how you define it. That won't get everyone into the ICU, but if you define it as needing to give blood, it's probably, you know, on average close to that. As people look back, it seems like a lot of it, you know, it's all obvious in, in the rearview mirror, but a lot of it is... Um, preventable and uh, preventable by saying, yeah, we have a lot of blood loss here. Let's get on top of it. Let's do things to manage it. Let's do things to replace, replace the blood, and we'll look at some of that. So, you know, this is common sense. Get help, IV access, do things, you know, Trendelenburg and other things to help the vital signs and start to replace things. Um, you know, from the battlefield, from trauma, from other places, we recognize that particularly as you start to really have a lot of bleeding, replacing more than two units, you need to be thinking about your clotting factors. I'm not sure that one-to-one -one FFP to packed red cells, as some have advocated, is really needed, needed. but probably two-to-one, you know, particularly as you have ongoing blood losses. I don't know if you have one here. Many places have what's called a massive transfusion protocol. So as you start to get up there, you need to, it's not just about the blood, you know, the, the pack cells. It's about the FFP as well. You want to look, why is it? How do we treat it? How is mom doing? You know, uh, is, if it's antepartum, I, okay, it's 28 weeks, and this previa is bleeding like crazy, and yeah, we really want to get her to 30 weeks, and yeah, we really want to get this 20-weeker out of our center, and there are times when it's still best to do a delivery here. You know, the, the people that, from a time gone by, who really look at it will say there are many reasons why whole blood is a better thing. You know, it, it replaces a lot of stuff, not just the pack cells. Whole blood isn't available. Anymore, most places, I assume here, have some O negative emergency blood that can be released and given. Um, some details about how to administer it. Um, you probably have a, a blood warmer that can be used because as you start to give a lot of blood, you really want it to be uh, warmed up. There are, it's really about PAC cells and FFP. There are really few indications for cryoprecipitate platelets, you know, related to transfusion alone. People have looked at things like factor seven, which is enormously expensive and honestly seems associated increasingly as we look at it with bad outcomes as much as good out. It was for a while it was held up as the magic. When everything else didn't work, give them some factor seven and that would stop everything. Very unclear that it's a good idea. It causes things like stroke and thrombosis and so third trimester bleeding, look, the most common reason that people have some bleeding is some early labor or preterm labor, but that's bleeding and not hemorrhage, right? You're not going to exsanguinate from. So someone comes in with some bleeding, yeah, you've got to wonder if she's going into labor, but that's not, the, that's not what we're talking about here. So the first case, painless bleeding, you know, kind of the, the, the classic for a placenta, 
placenta previa. Um, one in 200 births, more common when you've had prior cesarean delivery. You know, we diagnose them all by ultrasound now. Annoyingly, we overcall things in the second trimester by saying it's close to the cervix. 90% of so-called low-lying placentas. So placentas that come up to or within two centimeters of the cervix but don't cover it, almost always they'll resolve. You can be very reassuring about that, begging the question about why those of us who do ultrasound aren't just very reassuring about it and dismiss the whole thing. Uh, sometime over a beer we'll talk about it. I'm not sure I know the answer. I try, but I can't get my colleagues to do it. So multiple gestation, just having more placenta, you're more likely to get someone over, uh, some over the os. Prior cesarean delivery, more likely to be there. I'm not clear to me why increasing age causes placenta previa, but has been associated with it. The picture that you all recognize. Again, deliver, it's a term. Is it remote from term and the bleeding isn't too much? Watch them, temporize, prepare for delivery, things like antenatal steroids. There may be some times when you're crazy remote from delivery, 26 weeks, 28 weeks, that it makes sense to transfuse. If it's, you know, a slow trickle, but it's not all coming out at once, it may be that, you know, bumping up the hematocrit, keeping moms pregnant for a while makes sense. Abruption, so painful bleeding, second trimester, second, third trimester. How is it, how is it different? Well, um, um, similar, similar rate, some different risks, smoking, trauma, hypertension, cocaine. So this is something, um, you know, I trained in the 80s and 90s and, and, and you know, um, the word on the street was that if you came to the hospital and you used some cocaine in the parking lot, you'd have a really fast and uncomplicated labor. And it didn't always work that way. Sometimes we saw a lot of abruptions um, um, from cocaine. Um, has a, a little bit of a higher um, recurrence risk. Um, um, ultrasound isn't so helpful. Just because you don't see it on ultrasound doesn't mean that it's um, not there and so. It really is a clinical diagnosis. goes along with a pattern of contractions, you know, every minute, a regular pattern. Um, for those of you who don't know, Clay Howard Betke is a test that looks for maternal, uh, fetal cells and maternal circulation. So yes, it's good evidence of some bleeding exchange of blood between moms and babies, and it takes days to come back, and there's no way it's going to be useful to you. Um, you know, I, I don't know why you might want to do it. So here's placenta, and there's just blood behind the placenta. The acute blood sets up for reasons that I don't understand, a cascade in which women can chew up their clotting factors. And so a little, in contrast to previa, abruption is even at higher risk for coagulopathy. And so why does that matter? Well, number one, you're going to think about replacement, but number two, if you think someone has an abruption, and it's bad, and they're bleeding a lot, and you're like, oh, the baby doesn't look good, mom doesn't look good, let's go ahead and just dive in here. Think for a second. You may be dying, you know, doing a C-section with someone who's coagulopathic. What do you do? You know, so a quick way to know that, maybe many of you have done it, is when you're drawing your blood, you draw a red top, and you just see if it clots, right? Doesn't clot after 10 minutes, not so good. Um, it used to be said, the right answer, I was always taught, you know, when the, the chairman was asking me or I was taking my boards, was that if the red top tube didn't clot, I was going to not, you know, I was going to let the baby die, but wait, you know, before I um, cut into mom and maybe ca caused her to be sicker. I don't know that that's a real easy thing to do, very honestly. But I think the answer is that abruption, you're concerned about clotting, be sure to, let, be sure to think about it, let the blood bank know, get, be getting ready to give someone lots of products because you may need, again, especially, you know, as a result of your surgery, replace more than has come out from the abruption alone. Same thing, if it's term, deliver, um, preterm you may watch have blood products available, vigilant for concealed bleeding in DIC. So an abruption, 
It can be a high volume that's really all but hidden from you. I won't dwell on this. Some other, uh, because of time, I won't look at some other things that can cause bleeding in the third trimester. These are much more uncommon, and they're, and they're, they're unlikely to cause continued life-threatening bleeding to mom, right? A vasa previa, that's bad because it's a baby's blood that's coming out. But that's not, so that's, you know, there's a blood vessel. Sometimes the cord doesn't insert in the center of the placenta. It inserts in the membranes, and the vessels run through the membranes. And well-meaning obstetrician midwife goes in to break the bag of water, and oh my gosh, suddenly there's a ton of blood coming out. You know, bad, but again, that's baby's blood, not mom's. It's not going to make mom sick. So we'll turn for a second to postpartum hemorrhage. Again, the risk we talked about before. You know, there's a whole long list of etiologies. Is it a retained placenta? Is there a laceration? Is there some underlying, oh my gosh, you've just done a first delivery on someone who knew she has von Willebrand's disease and she's bleeding. I mean, you know, the answer, you know, 99 times out of 100 is atne, atne, atne. The uterus isn't contracting down. Yes, need to think about the other things, but this is, this is where we're going to focus our attention tonight. Um, the risks, something that makes the uterus large, something that makes the uterus tired. You've been trying to put someone into labor for a long time. You've been using um, magnesium. You have infection. Um, but most patients with postpartum, or a lot of patients with postpartum hemorrhage, don't have a risk factor. And it really is unpredictable in any place that does deliveries needs to be prepared for this, and anyone who thinks they can predict it and know who it's going to happen and is fooling themselves. So we try to massage the uterus to get it to contract. We give oxytocin. Be sure you're getting IV access, and then you turn to your three meds usually. Methogen, careful of someone being induced for preeclampsia. It can uh, make the high blood pressure worse. Hemabate, prostaglandin F2-alpha. Not so great if someone has asthma and bronchospasm. Misoprostol probably can be really used in most folks, has some side effects of diarrhea um, and, and fever. Um, but misoprostol, no better or worse than the others, but increasingly is what folks turn to because it's cheap, available, doesn't need to be refrigerated. I won't dwell on, on, on methogen, except there really is, are concerns when people are hypertensive um, and um, it does carry a warning that says that it can cause, uh, has been associated or in um, kind of reports with heart attacks. Brian Bateman, I, some others, large data set, tried to argue pretty hard that methogen isn't associated with, with MIs, and so that shouldn't be a reason to avoid it. Just backing up, do you see any role for routine CDC transmission? Um, it's a longer question, but the answer is no, probably not routine, but yes for many patients who you think are at risk for bleeding. Um, so um, don't need to do those on everyone. Is there any role for repeated doses of methogen? I mean, if, it works, if it doesn't work, it So, you know, the answer is that it, when you repeat it, you're really supposed to wait a long time, like four to six hours. Um, that I discovered by not giving it a long time and having someone senior me point out that it was much too frequent. So I really, um, unlike hemabate that you can dose a little more frequently, um, methogen probably not. We talked about this um, before, it can be given IM, if you're having trouble in the OR, it can be given right into the uterus itself. It doesn't work any better if it's given right into the uterus, but it looks like you're serious and you mean business. Um, PGE1, mesoprostol, the nice thing is it's a pill. If you're thinking about obstetric hemorrhage as a worldwide problem, this is a great thing. It's cheap. The pills, are, pills cost pennies. Um, can be used in folks. Um, with high blood pressure and asthma. Um, um, a thousand micrograms, so a milligram, often given rectally is how um, most commonly used. Um, because of time, I won't dwell on all of these things. Lots of other things that the obstetricians in the room know about, you know, kind of cinching the uterus down, 
Um, so to do that, obviously, you need to operate and access the uterus, but kind of putting a stitch, a B-Lynch suture to hold it down, blowing up balloons inside the uterus to tamponade the walls of the uterus. People have come up um, in the third world with some really neat versions of this using a Foley and a condom and just blowing, blowing that up um, um, inside and, and really can, can save lives. Um, this is a quick case, but I think a, a really important message. And I apologize, it's probably a message you all know. Um, so here's a patient. She's had miscarriages as a child that's affected with autism. 12 weeks, seems good, no issues. Shows up eight weeks later in an emergency room, maybe in your office. Cough, malaise, fever of 101. You know, it's flu season, what has she got? She has, she has flu, or, or we're concerned that she has flu. Um, as I said before, it's not that pregnant women get the flu more commonly. When they get it, they get sicker. So. 2009 was it 2010, H1N1, 5% of flu-related deaths in this country were in pregnant women, and only 1% of people in the country were pregnant. So overrepresented in those who died, and, and morbidity as well. Um, Maybe that the fever that goes along with it, by the way, early on, is associated with, with birth defects. I'm glad to hear questions or concerns about this, but I can't emphasize this enough. Um, if you think of flu, if someone has malaise, fever, and a cough, do not pass go. Just write them a prescription for Tamiflu. Call it in. Um, uh, think about having the first couple of doses available to give to them to take home. Um, I am glad to hear objections or arguments otherwise, but we do not think that there is a role where we, I mean, not only at Mass General, but um, ACOG does not think there's a role for rapid flu testing. Too often it gives a false negative. Um, treat them, treat them, treat them. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. And they, they, you know, the acetaminophen, especially in the first trimester when folks are at risk for birth defects, can reduce fevers, so important that way. And these women get sick. Um, even though they've gotten Tamiflu. So um, what we do during flu season is we have a list of folks that we've been suspicious of, treated the day before, and we call them the next day. Um, um, you know, how you doing? Oh, I'm feeling worse. I, I really have, you know, uh, breathing's getting more difficult. Do not pass go. Come right back to the hospital. Um, do you have a temperature cut off? Yeah, not, maybe not formally, but I mean... 100.4, Joey, nothing, nothing different than usual. So, in some recent emergency medicine literature, they're arguing about whether or not healthy patients with the flu should be getting Tamiflu or not, number one. And number two, if they're a day or two into it, there's probably not a lot of evidence that does anything. So would you, you see a pregnant female who's a day or two or three, would you do it anyway? I'll do it anyway. It's, it's a recommendation. And I recognize the challenges and evidence here supported, you know, by the CDC, among others, um, to do. And so we, we I, I have no doubt we're over-treating. But this really is, you know, the mistake is saying they're young, they're healthy, go home. I mean, in, you know, our ICUs, maybe yours too, every flu season we have some pregnant women you know, right alongside the, the old folks that are sick because of the flu. Um, it can really be um, a bad thing. And of course, you know, what we'd really like to do and, um, is prevent it. Um, and um, this will save lives. Vaccination. There is no trimester that you cannot give the flu vaccine in. Um, so everyone should get vaccinated. It doesn't matter if they're pregnant or not. There is no contraindication to vaccinating women for flu. You know, I, I, you know autism and um, thymerosal, you know, look, there's, you know, that, that association 
doesn't exist. But even if you think it exists, the single dose vials don't have it in it. There, you, we, we have to, and, and it's very clear that obstetricians, midwives, our offices in particular can make a real difference here, but so can, so can our hospitals. Um, and, and, and so um, um, you will increasingly see campaigns, and it's made a difference. Pregnant women are more likely to get vaccinated now. Um, so um, it's, it's a real important message I'd offer you here. You know, the problem is that if you look at flu and pregnancy, see here, I Googled it here, and you see that what comes up, I was looking for pictures like this, right? See where I stole a picture from it. Here it is, what are the symptoms of autism? I mean, this is, I mean, I, your place, ours, this is what we're fighting against. Um, I, I, um, I, I wish I had a better way except to say that that link does not exist and you will get sicker from not having the vaccine than from um, any effects it's going to have, any negative effects on your pregnancy. Um, we avoid live viruses in pregnancy, so the flu mist um, is avoided, although again, I'm unaware of any adverse outcomes linked, linked to that. Yeah. Blame it on me, I don't care what you have to do. Give them, give them, give them a flu. This is, this is important. Um, okay, I'm mindful of time. Um, I, you've seen some of this before. Um, so I'll, I'll cut to the chase. You know, someone collapses, you do what you normally do. You start CPR. So what's different? Um, use your hands to try to displace the uterus to get it off of the vena cava to get more um, circulation and return. Why don't you just put them on a backboard on their side the way we do during surgery? Because it's really difficult to do CPR with someone on an angle, it's going to be ineffective. So either of those on the left is an example of kind of displacing the uterus. Put your hands a little higher up. That's because the organs are higher up and you don't want to be doing CPR against the liver. Boy, it's a sad day. It's a, it's a bad day for a patient when I'm putting the paddles on. Um, um, and, uh, uh, you know, for where different anatomy, where things are, the paddle location is different as well. Yes, it is safe to shock folks in pregnancy. You know, yeah, I know it's electric. It, it, the, the way the current goes, it goes through the heart. It doesn't go down here. And, I mean, I don't mean to be facetious, but it's much better than being dead. Um, um, you know, the complications really haven't been um, reported. Doses of medicines are the same. Um, and so it often comes up when to deliver. So consider delivery above 20 weeks, either because it's going to improve the efficiency of CPR or because you have a fetus that is viable and it's really sad. We don't think mom's going to make it, but we're going to, we're going to help um, the baby. A couple things that go along with this. You need to know, first of all, someone's gestational age. That's pretty common these days, but above the belly button, you feel the uterus. That's more than, than, than 20 weeks. Someone can do a quick ultrasound, maybe, maybe not in the, in, in the minute. Um, you, ideally, you'll have some sense when someone came into the emergency room, particularly if you're doing it, you know, like to try to salvage a baby that the baby's alive, right, when they, they came in. But, you know, I don't, evidence from the trauma and other literature that CPR can be more efficacious when you get the uterus out of the way. So about five minutes. And when you decide to do it, you guys got to do it there. You know, there's not time then to then move them to labor and delivery and, and, and other places. Um, now, if mom's not arrested but she's in distress, Whole different, whole different uh, kettle of fish. I know you know all of that. I'll just summarize things early, which is basically that you know it's the same, same process that you would go along, go through otherwise. Um, in large part, set with uterine displacement, and then consider, you know, when to deliver. Um, happily, these cases don't happen 
often, but when they do, they stick in, in everyone's mind. I don't know if you guys have had occasion to do any of these here. Yeah, yeah I, I won't wish it upon you. Not happy. One question about that. Is there any, um, as far as uh, if there's a partner or a spouse or somebody there, is there some conversation that needs to be happening in that moment? Either about having or to be there? Really? About having to be there, you mean? Or, uh, or about, about what they want to do? About delivering the, the baby in that moment and doing a yeah. section during Yeah, that. I mean, there is. I mean, you know, it's possible conversation to imagine in the moment. I think, you know, as an obstetrician, but also, you know, academically, I spend a lot of time puzzling through reproductive ethics. And so I'm a lot about saying it's about the mom and the mom and, you know, babies are important, but that we should be focused on the mom. And I think here's a case where there also is some reasonable evidence that helps mothers as well. So I think that that's kind of how you can emphasize things that you're not really doing it to, 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 to save the baby um, that may or may not be a byproduct of it. Um, it's a really difficult conversation to have, obviously. Okay, one more and then we'll be done. This one was a real case of mine. Really messed up. Otherwise, nice Saturday. Um, older woman, not her first baby. We knew she had a previa. She came in bleeding. We went to do her section. All going routine. She's closing the fascia. She says something doesn't feel right. And suddenly she's gone, apneic and unresponsive. Pulseless electrical activity. We start resuscitation. And this makes anyone who does OB think about an amniotic fluid embolism. So sudden collapse, often with a premonition of dread or something's wrong, um, with no other explanation for it. Um, you know, no history of cardiac disease, no antecedent cardiac arrhythmia. Um, tough to get at it, but um, you know, pretty unusual, one in 10,000 or less. Some risk factors there. But you can have most of those risk factors and it'll never happen, right? You're never going to predict. This is an unpredictable thing. Show up with hypotension, hypoxia, first just not feeling right, and then become coagulopathic. Here are the number of women that have these things, and here's the kind of first sign. So you'll see a lot of times, 30%, there was just, they were agitated and then they went, they went out. Fortunate or unfortunate, I've seen maybe this four or five times, and most of the times there is just a minute or two if something's not right. Um, um, and, and in this case, there was something not right, and I was starting to get really anxious. Why is it not right? I hadn't yet even, I, I, you know, I, I, I knew at a subconscious level that something wasn't happening. Biphasic response. So first, you get kind of a left heart that's empty and a right heart that's full because the, the pulmonary vasculature is clamped down. And so we'll look at an echo of that, pulmonary hypertension. And then it evolves into left-sided dysfunction, um, complete with endothelial activation and leaky, leaky endothelium. So here, early on, see a full right heart, empty left heart. And then during the second phase, the left heart will be full. Um, and dysfunctional. Echo, you know, if you can get it, can sometimes really help you here and know a little bit about what's, what's going on, where they're at, whether or not you should push volume or not. So this isn't that long ago. It's 1976. This, you know, it depends the series you read, probably at least a 25% mortality. Older series, it used to be 50 to 100%. So someone here survived and it merited a case report. Okay. Um, survival is an uncommon occurrence. Um, most recent series suggest that it's less than that. Yeah. I've got a question. You know, in a lot of these like OB emergencies where you really have to have a partnership between OB and, and the medical or the intensive yeah. or whatever, where do you feel the, the 
the best care is able to be given, like in an ED where they have access to all of the stuff, or in OB where you have access to low grade, like. Yeah, I, I would say in 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 an OR. So what I would do if you know if it happens in your OR, stay in your OR. If it happens on labor and delivery, move them to the OR if if you can really quick, or you may need to do it at the at the bedside. I mean, a lot of this you'll see evolves into starting CPR, and then and then you're stuck. Um, but yes, you do need monitoring and intensive monitoring, the stuff that you're not going to find in the usual labor and delivery room. But happily, on most labor and deliveries, an OR is close at hand. So that's where I'd think to go. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, hemorrhage was first, but this is, this is third in terms of, uh, in this country, um, what seems to kill um, mothers. Um, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not a, it's not a long and torturous, you know, is there bleeding? Is there um, an underlying cardiac arrhythmia? Um, is it a high spinal that we've given? Um, but pretty quickly you're going to be down to some kind of embolic event. Um, you know, it can be difficult to distinguish a massive saddle pulmonary embolism in many ways from an amniotic fluid embolism. Um, you know, in this case, this was someone that we were giving them prophylaxis against clots, you know, during the case. Um, it's more of a trivia thing. It used to be, the thought used to be that this was all fetal cells and maternal circulation causing some massive anaphylactic reaction. And so the diagnosis you know, was made based on seeing these cells, often at autopsy, stuck in women's lungs. And it's pretty clear that that's not the case, that if you look, um, and, you know, there was a time when um, it was popular to float swan, swan, swans in everyone, and you could su it became pretty apparent that a lot of healthy women, there was all this stuff in the lungs as well. So this is not the test that demonstrates that amniotic fluid embolism is there. It really is a clinical, a clinical picture. I'm not sure how they got permission to float swans and suck out blood in this study. Um, so acute fetal compromise, usually a rest. Uh, um, um, you, you know, again, you just want to be, sh you, you want an uh, initial period of hypotension. It's often then succeeded by hemorrhage and DIC. Um, that's the clinical diagnosis. Um, you know, what do you do? You support people as best you can. There's no easy answer here. Start CPR, give them blood products. Um, um, you'll see people have tried all kinds of crazy stuff like uh, bypass. Um, it won't be available virtually any other place. This woman that I took care of was very lucky. She had her amniotic fluid embolism on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Why is that a good time to? have an amniotic fluid embolism, because it turns out that the cardiac surgeons are around, but they're not actually operating. Um, and so they could come quickly. And we actually put this woman on ECMO. Um, and she was on ECMO for a day, two days. Um, and um, that, kept her, that kept her alive. Um, and um, I never thought it would happen, but she actually walked out of the ICU about 10 days later, um, amazingly alive. I never thought, never thought it, it would happen. Um, so oxygen intubation, um, you know, it, you can decide how, it's a trick, right? Initially you need to give them volume to help get circulation, but recognize that all that, they're gonna start to leak all that volume out pretty quickly. So it's a, it's a little bit of a balance. Um, you may need to support them with some of the pressors there. Um, not unusual to have DIC and atony afterwards as you don't stop perfusing the uterus, it stops contracting. Um, this patient had atony and wound up with a hysterectomy at the bedside in the um, ICU. Um, you know, extraordinary measures just aren't available every place. And even with, you know, fair chance that these women will die um, in spite of everyone, you know, doing things. This is, it's a kind of thing, though, that, you know, we should think at places of having checklists for, you know, because this will come along 
here, what, maybe once every 10 years, if ever. And there's no way, you know, there's no way you can have all this in your head. Um, so I've listed some of the, the things there, but some of it is thinking about it. So otherwise, sudden collapse, hypotension, hypoxia, is it an amniotic fluid embolism? Get a lot of help, get access, oxygenate them, start CPR, start replacing blood products. Questions about that? Uh, and there's, you know, I, just one more thing. Uh, you know, I know from my own experience, having been through bunches of these, these take a toll, right? People come into the hospital to have babies, and we expect them, and our colleagues expect them to be well and healthy, and they take a toll on all of us. Um, you know, when these cases happen to me, it takes forever for me to recover, and so we need to be mindful of the effect it has on us. And I hope here you have in place programs to support people that have maybe done great care. You can provide perfect care to someone with an amniotic fluid embolism and have the patient die. And that's not going to feel good to anybody. Um, and I don't know why it might feel better in the emergency room if an older person comes in with an MI and dies. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but um, we need to be mindful of each other because it really can, it really can take a toll. Um, I, I joked before about it being um, you know, a sip from a fire hose. Um, and, and so I know I've gone through much too much, too fast, to many of you who know far more about this than I do, who live through it. And so as you have questions, um, I'm glad to hear. The hour's late. I'm glad to stick around and, and answer them. Um, I, I totally appreciate your attention. You know, it's easy to find us. Um, so, you know, let us know. I mean, I, you know, seriously, I mean, you know, you're having... You think you're in the middle of an amniotic fluid embolism and, you know, call a friend. You know, I, I can't, you know, I can't be there, but we can talk it through a little bit. You know, more minds thinking about unusual problems. You know, you know there are lots of, lots of people on labor and delivery all the time as there are here. So, okay. Thank you all very much. I'll stick around. <laughs>